what I wanted to do first is to give you an image of what drives me forward in Fusion. Imagine you're reaching up and you're grabbing the sun, something of the order of 100 million degrees Celsius, and you want to put the sun in a bottle. And we have ways of doing that. We create a magnetic bottle. Compared to anything that mankind has ever done in the past, be it walking on the moon, be it decoding DNA, this is a great challenge. We as humans, we're lazy <laughs> in, in the sense that uh, if we have a choice of going a very easy path or a very complicated path, we would always go the easy path. And that's what we're doing with energy. We're burning fossil fuels, coal, natural gas, crude oil, and that is changing the environment. We're similar to, I hate to say it, to yeast, where the yeast basically multiply, 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 eat up all of the, the flour in the dough until basically they die off from their own excrement uh, because they've just eaten up all the resources and they've died from the only pollution that they've created. We have to find a clean source that's going to be available for lifetimes, and that's what fusion is. I, I really feel that if we don't crack fusion, we are doomed, to be honest. What we're trying to do here is to make a artificial star. Stars have some things we don't have on Earth, size and mass. The sun, for example, is a very nice fusion reactor that enjoys considerable public support, and it works on the basis of gravity plus its magnetic field uh, to confine the plasma. Now, the sun is really big, 800,000 miles, something like across. Uh, we clearly don't want anything that big, so we have to rely on the magnetic fields alone. That turns out to be doable, but technologically difficult to do on a large scale. 
And so we've been learning how to do this for about 40 or 50 years. What's amazing about work in that era is we didn't know what the energy process that drove stars was. Hans Bethe, the nuclear physicist, uh, was at a seminar. And uh, the next day, he was going to give a talk where he talked about a fusion fuel cycle for the stars. But he had a date that night. And so they went out for a walk. And he came out with what has to be the best line ever, which is, aren't the stars beautiful tonight? And right now, I'm the only guy in the world who knows why. In the sun's core, when these particles are accelerated to high speeds and collide, they fuse. Fusion fuel is an essentially infinite supply and is available to all countries at negligible cost. The fuel for fusion is in common water. Fusion will produce no noxious chemical combustion products and there will be absolutely no chance of a runaway reaction. And fusion will not involve materials that could be stolen or used for clandestine purposes. When I came into this project almost 20 years ago, there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. Everyone was confident of success. In the Zeta apparatus, we have produced temperatures which are about one third of those at the center of the sun. That so this enthusiasm was a kind of ignorant enthusiasm. As fusion researchers have painfully discovered, it's just not that simple. After this initial enthusiasm, then came a decade of caution and skepticism. And now, after 20 years, we are back to enthusiasm. In the early 1980s, we expect to create many thermal megawatts of fusion energy for the first time. So the whole planet needs a lot of energy. And so far, we've been running mostly on fossil fuel. Been a good run. It got us to where we are, but we have to stop. So we are trying different type of uh, energy, now alternative energy. But it proved quite difficult to find something that's as convenient and as cost effective as oil, gas, and coal. Now, we know of two ways of making uh, nuclear energy, fission and fusion. Now, in fission, you take a big nucleus, you break it in part in two, and makes lots of energy. And this is how the nuclear reactor today works. Works pretty good. And then there's fusion. Now, I like fusion. Fusion's much better. So you take two small nucleus, you put it together, and you make helium. And that's very nice. Makes lots of energy. And if the whole planet would run on fusion, it would run, we could extract the fuel from the ocean, it would run for billions and billions of years. Now, if fusion is so great, why don't we have it? Where is it? Well, there's always a bit of a catch. Fusion is really, really hard to do. Physics-wise, fusion is the, the, the fusion <laughs> of two nucleus. Usually, you use a hydrogen nucleus or isotope of hydrogen. And when they touch each other, they fuse together. And they make helium and release a lot of energy in the form of a fast neutron. So this is the, the, the nuclear reaction in center. Now, the problem is those two nucleus, they're electrically charged, they're both positive, so they don't want to stick together. They go like this, and they never fuse. So in order to fuse, you have to throw them at great speed. And speed in a gas is the temperature. So you have to heat the gas so the thermal agitation is fast enough so the nucleus can touch each other. And that temperature is 150 million degrees C. That's pretty hot. And this is how the stars work. The, the, the stars are very hot, and inside the star, there's this fusion reaction. So in, on the Earth there, we need to heat the gas to 150 million degrees C. And the other problem is a gas that hot wants to cool down. So it cools down really quickly. So you put some energy in there to heat it up, and then the heat escape. And when it's hot enough, it makes some reaction, it makes some fusion, it makes some energy. So the name of the game is to try to get more energy out than you put in.
most ambitious attempt to harness fusion as a source of power is taking shape in France. The project is costing 13 billion pounds and it's being backed by a whole swathe of countries around the world. It is going to be built from about a million pieces, so it's a real nightmare to know where pieces are and don't lose them, know which piece goes where, what is this piece that I'm looking at. We build the tokamak from the bottom up, so you can only build it in a certain way. So if a certain piece is missing, we'll have to wait for it. So it's key that at the moment what we're doing is a very large planning effort with all the members to make sure that each piece is delivered to us in good time and at the right time. The parties all want to learn all the technologies, which means you're not giving one component to a part, you're giving a piece of a component and the other part they want another piece of the same component so that they all can learn the technology. It is luckily not so that we have seven pieces of each component, that would be too <laughs> difficult, but we have sometimes three or four pieces of each component and that means... We have to talk to our partners, to the members, in all the, as you say, in all these countries around the world, in Korea, in Japan, Russia, China, US, India. You have not one guy to deal with, you have three or four guys to deal with for the same component. We are pushing the edge of technology and therefore sometimes we run into problems and we have to solve these problems. Critics point out that the costs have trebled in five years and they say the whole project is a gamble that won't pay off. Will we be able with our complex um, structure and the money we have to be in time? This is actually the most uh, difficult thing at the moment, to stay in time. What's slowly taking shape here in the southern French countryside could provide the answer to the world's energy crisis, or it might prove one of the most expensive failures in scientific history. So I'm going to try to go through quickly. I want to give you an idea of the realistic schedule. I received an email this morning of a new first plasma date which is different from the first plasma date that you will see, uh, well, which was the first plasma date of about two weeks ago, which is different from what you'll see. So there's some uh, three iterations behind in the first plasma date. When the ED organization uh, came about in 2006, we said that we would be producing the first plasma in 10 years. And if you guys do the math real quickly, you realize that we're not ready for first plasma next year. Sure, we're gonna put this guy. There's a toad. What was that? He was in inside the uh, compost, so he digs underneath the uh, in, in the compost pile to stay warm. And my problem is that I turn the compost all the time, so I don't want him to go in there again. I'm gonna put him underneath here. Well, back when I was started fusion, back in the 19 mid 1980s. The, the idea was that fusion was going to be successful and we would have fusion on the grid in about 50 years. And now it's uh, you know, 35 years into my, no, 30 years into my career now. You know, up until about 2000, the year 2000, we were just advancing and advancing at really a fast rate. And now the problem is, is that uh, in order to make the next step, we just need to go to a bigger machine. And unfortunately, bigger machines take longer to build, are much more complex. I know that I will be retiring before Eater is successful. So I'm like the, the guy building a cathedral who have, knows that he's gonna be putting this brick on, this brick on, this brick on, and he's gonna be spending his whole career putting bricks together, but he'll never see the end piece of the cathedral that'll take hundreds of years to build. I tell you, this time scale for the construction and building of machines like ITER is like 100 years. To 
tokomak was invented very early in Russia. The idea of the fusion uh, as the energy source was started by Lavrentiev in the remote island Sakhalin. He, he had no education. He was self-educated. He makes this first idea of a reactor, and he sent his proposals uh, to Moscow. It received by Stalin. He was not completely right, but it make Sakharov, who was a real great scientist, uh, to propose the real solution. We both uh, agree of the importance of international cooperation and fusion. My name is Evgeny Velikov, and uh, now my main position is honorary something. Uh, next step was when Gorbachev arrived. Uh, I have a day I told Gorbachev to propose to me to run a fusion reactor. Not all people was uh, very optimistic on this. But next meeting of Gorbachev was with Reagan in the uh, Geneva, first meeting. Mr. Oh, we have so many prime minister presidents in this time change. Soviet Union disappeared, yes? We have Russia. Much longer adventure than political. I was gonna ask, do you want me to explain the gyro turn real quick? And I can do it very quickly and really cool. If you take, I don't have a Coke bottle. If you take a Coke bottle and you blow across the top of a Coke bottle. Yeah, you want, can, can you get me a Coke bottle downstairs? Are you it's serious? Down, it's down over there. I have four minutes. No, how much? Uh, yes, four minutes. Four minutes? Is that okay? Down, it's downstairs uh, over there. You know where the coffee machine is? Yes. The gyro turn works pretty much like a Coke bottle, except instead of blowing across the top of the Coke bottle and change the resonance, um, it, it you you do a electron beam. Is you have basically a little, filament down here like in a light bulb and it heats up and this beam of electrons comes up and you get a resonance so just as you take your coke bottle you blow across the top of it and the wind is creating a, a compression wave and making a resonance of making the sound go up higher this thing is passing an electron beam and it creates an electromagnetic resonance you can almost imagine it like a bunch of little laser beams that you combine then into a single coherent beam, which gives a gyrotron beam. And then once this ignites the plasma, the plasma itself heats it and keeps going. Does that make sense, kind of? Can you have a light gyrotron? Oh no, it doesn't have to be a glass one. Oh man. <laughs> oh, oh, what was the analogy? What did you do with a can? 
Uh, no, I'm not keying at a bottle. Can. Ah, you wanted the bottle. Yeah, because you can blow across the top of the bottle to make it resonate. And you call yourself a physicist? Man, I, I am to so the embarrassed. On, on the, on the, but why the cork? The, the greatest challenge is, is to align these huge pieces to the millimeter uh, tolerance, to the accuracy that we need. It's really the magnets, the, the, what we call the, t the toroidal field magnets. These magnets make the main magnetic field of ITER. They're the things that hold this magnetic bottle, hold the plasma inside the machine and keep it away from the walls. And the accuracy that we, we can install these magnets really is how smooth the plasma will be and therefore how well it performs. So the better we do and the, and the closer we get to the, to the required position for these magnets will, will really affect for decades the future performance of ITER. So that's a great challenge for us. very happy when they, you know, they decided to go ahead with ITER and uh, they called me and say, okay, would you like to come and be responsible for the TF coil? It was like a dream coming true. This used to be a washing machine company, uh, which essentially went through a crisis, so they were planning to close it. So ISG bought this premises. We had a good deal with the agreement that they would hire these people. They brought here a number of experienced persons who trained the person who used to work here. Most of them are very young and we were very excited to do something, if you want, innovative, creative, and think compared with the kind of activity they were doing before. Well, you need some area, of course, to absorb yeah, yeah. the excess material. Ooh, ooh. Can you remove the race without damaging the glass? I think it's important that we do something up front to be prepared to the situation where people will see cracks and will say, ah, we don't take any responsibility, nobody's going to take any, I, I'm sure. None of us think that the crack is going to propagate, but it would be good to have some evidence. Okay, for sure. You cannot avoid that. And I don't think they have any impl mechanical implications. I'm curing them, I'm curing with my hand. Uh... Salve. Salve. See, that is not a work for emotional weak people, because you need to be very strong and confident, because otherwise you will never do anything. You will just be so scared. Although ITER is called the largest scientific enterprise international collaboration on Earth at the moment, nobody knows about us. ITER is, um, is working with public money, so the whole project is jointly funded by all these nations under the ITER roof, and so in fact it's the taxpayer who pays for what we do, right? So this is not a private organization or private enterprise. This is one of our top benchmarks that we develop this this project and this fusion reactor for the benefit of everything and we want everybody to to share and to join in and to be proud of this right so transparency and having an an op open door policy is one of our top priorities in ETO communications a lot of people talk about a magnetic bottle, and I don't feel there's a good understanding of how the magnetic field ties with this idea of trapping a particle. Mm -hmm. And then I want to go into the challenge of ITER. Uh, the question is, well, how come we're taking a long time? They made a study back in 1976 that showed that depending upon how you fund fusion, you can either get a fusion device generating electricity somewhere in the 1990s, 
out to 2006, all depending upon how much money you put in as a function of time. And then I'm going to overlay this is what the U.S. has actually been funding. And the funding has gone up. It peaked around 1978, and then it's dropped well below based on, the two, on today's dollars. It's very understandable, very honest, but I won't do this because we no? have the U.S. here on Monday uh, physically. And <clears throat> it's a very touchy thing in the U.S. because here you're picking out the U.S. funding. We have to be careful. We don't, in the official presentation, not to criticize Right? Yeah. We, have, we can say well, it's difficult, right? Yeah. Because um, in the 70s the funding was wow, everybody wanted fusion to happen now, then everything Oof. dropped again, right? Yeah. We survived, we managed to survive, and we are here now building the world's largest fusion device. But it's hard, and it only happens, and we say we can deliver uh, around the mid of the century, provided yeah. that we have somebody uh, sort of. Funding us in the back. Funding us in the back, right? And so to me, before we basically die in our excrement like yeast molecules, we need to realize that we need another energy source. We need to be, it may not be for our generation. I mean, the good news is we're, we're okay, but it's the next generation or the generation after that or the generation after that. Yeah, I'm actually surprised how low the funding is. Would you be able to have uh, better progress, faster progress if you had better funding? I think so. There was a study made in one country. I'm not going to name the country. Uh, back in the 70s. And they said if you, you keep the level of the order of, let's say, I think it was about 800 million euros per year, you would be able to achieve an eater like machine uh, within about 20 years. Then if you drop it down to about 500 million, it would be extended out to about 30 years. And there was a point of no return where basically if you invested 300 million euros on a year to year basis, you would actually it would take infinity to achieve a reactor because there you had to su keep the supporting technology base, the, the, the administrative funds. Uh, if you go below 300 million, you'll never get fusion. Well, that country has never invested more than something like 200 million euros. The more money you put into it, the faster the return. And, and we really have been putting in peanuts. I don't think there's a broad public uh, acceptance of hydrogen fusion in the United States at this stage. Uh, people back in the U.S. still, uh, in general, don't understand the differences between uranium fission, which is the process that has been used in nuclear power plants for over 40 years now, and hydrogen fusion, uh, which I believe is the process of the future. You have to keep in mind a couple of things. You know, first, this is one of the grand challenges of engineering. And solving a, a grand challenge on a fixed price is, is a challenge in and of itself. Now, by the same token, uh, you have to be very cost and schedule conscience, conscious because the sponsors uh, of this project have to you know, continue to maintain their sponsorship and believe strongly that the cost is worth the investment. I actually got interested in fusion as a child. Uh, my mom, when I was eight, got me what I think was my first science book, which was about the sun. And I still remember vividly this illustration of this hundreds of millions of miles long coal train delivering all the coal that equaled the energy that the sun's fusion created in a single second. By the time I graduated, I actually didn't intend to go into fusion because this was the high point of the enthusiasm about the tokamak device, which is still the most funded device in fusion. And I thought, well, I guess this is solved. And I got interested instead in astrophysics and other things. But um, pretty soon it became clear, nope, it wasn't solved. 
The first error that was made in, by the government programs back in the 1970s was to put all their eggs in the tokamak basket. Now, 40 years later, people would have to say, objectively, we do not know which route will lead to practical fusion, and we certainly don't know which route will lead to the most economical fusion. What you have to do is take a crash program approach, a broad-based approach in which if there are 20 good ideas out there, and by good ideas, I don't mean ideas that I think will work. I mean ideas that I can't prove won't work. This is an important, vital question for humanity. What is an energy source that can replace fossil fuels that can be safe, clean, unlimited, and more economical, cheaper than anything we have today? I used to live on Barn Island, so the commute was great. So I could get on my bike, and it was like a 10-minute bike to the garage. The parts will arrive, and I would assemble all the parts, and I would actually do all the experiment myself. When there's only one guy here, this one guy show. So that was actually quite fun. I, I enjoyed that. And then I would build this machinery, and then I would fire it up, and then I would get the bad result, which is most of the time you get that. And then I would tweak it and adjust to little clicks on some sensor somewhere. And then I started to get some neutron coming out of this thing. So I was very excited about my neutrons. Then eventually I, I went out and tried to raise more money with that thing. The company got bigger and more successful, but the fun went downhill since then. Now, after my PhD, sadly, I did not manage to find a job in fusion. So I got a job at a local company doing laser printer because I was kind of good with lasers. Uh, it turns out that uh, what I was trying to do is was trying to make printing so cheap that we could cut the forest and jam you with uh, junk mail, you know? So that was not very satisfactory. And I was looking at the energy situation on the planet and it was pretty bad. I, I think we're going 100 miles an hour towards a brick wall and nobody seems to be paying much attention, you know? And it was actually on my birthday, the 40 years old birthday, and I decided I had a terrible middle life crisis. And I said, okay, I, I, I will change. I will not do this job anymore, and I will do fusion. In the center of the machine, there's a big sphere. And in that sphere, there's liquid metal. Now, the liquid metal is pumped by some pump in those pipes over there, and it's made up to swirl. So the, 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 the liquid is injected near the edge like this, and it swirls around. And because it swirls around, it opens a center, like there's a, a centrifugal force keep the liquid out, and there's a center open in the center of the thing. So we fire those 14 pistons all at the same time, and they're quite well synchronized. It's gonna go clonk, clonk, clonk. And then the, the, the acoustic waves squash the liquid, and it collapses the vortex over the plasma, and the plasma, when you compress it, will get hotter, and hopefully we will hit 150 million degrees C, which is the temperature required to make the nucleus to fuse. It's piston, it's rings, it's, uh, it's metal and pipes, it's plumbing. Turning that into a power plant will actually be not that complicated. I have, I have a saying here at General Fusion, I told all my engineer, if you can't find it at Home Depot, it doesn't go in the machine. So the, the tokamak and the laser fusion have more chance of working than what we do here, because the physics of compressing the plasma with the magnetic field is new. However, their chance of turning out a power plant that's cost effective is low because their machine is so complicated. I, I'm quite confident that we can make this work. I'm, I'm a little concerned that we might run out of money before we make it work.
have everywhere problems. We have uh, had problems in the Fiat coils, uh, and it was solved. Uh, we, we could go into the envelope uh, with the help of Japan, Europe, and so on. So many things we could bring into a reasonable envelope of schedule, but we cannot make miracles. The time lost is lost. I cannot recover. I can only be better from now on. The problem that I don't understand is how are you going to get there to 10 years from now? Because we heard this morning there's a problem for the vacuum vessel, tooling issues, all kinds of things. I don't see what the plan is. But I thought you have a much better plan uh, in terms of the technologies, engineering, the solutions. Well, whatever that is, I mean, convince us that I think we can get there within 10 years. Uh, this morning when I asked the DZ, what was the failure of this whole program was uh, wasting 10 years? He said it was a management, right? Is there any change doing There's a lot depending on ITER, right? So the whole fusion research going on all around the world, whether it's in China, in Europe, in the US, they all depend on ITER. So if ITER is closed down, a lot of people will not only, only lose their jobs, but um, fusion will be dead forever, or at least for a very, very long time. Nobody will ever bet on fusion for a long time. So this is our facility where in a storage facility, which is actually quite cheap. The key thing is more money has to go into fusion research. It has to go for many other devices, obviously including our own. We and our neighbors are shielded against the neutrons by three feet of concrete. It's also shielded by this copper mesh that radio waves can't get through. Now the main bank trigger is basically a big switch. When we're at full power, all 12 will be hooked up. These instruments are actually our thermometer. If you wonder how can you measure one or two billion degrees, this is it. Maybe there's some way you could tape this so that it's out of the line of sight. Okay. Even though we're a very tiny group, science is a collaborative effort. And we're collaborating through the scientific literature with people all around the world. Hey, you're on camera. <laughs> this is an important member of the team. This is Tom, who's the landlord here. I mean, people ask, how can you succeed with so few resources? You know, are you saying you're a thousand times smarter? No. We're saying we've got an easier route. A plasma, which is what most of the universe consists of, is electrically conducting matter, matter in which the electrons are stripped away from the atoms and can freely move about. What we today call the pinch effect forms instabilities within the uh, plasma, basically pinching the plasma into a lot of filamentary structures. 
the conventional attitude towards the instabilities is to suppress them. As I, we put it, is to make the plasma sit still like a good dog. The problem with that is the plasma doesn't want to sit still. And trying to confine the plasma for long enough for the fusion reactions to take place becomes sort of like confining a can of worms without the can. What we do is to imitate nature. In nature, on the scale of solar flares, quasars, entire galaxies, these filaments organize and structure the universe. What's your trigger pressure? So when the machine fires, we get a ion beam that goes down this drift tube. Once the machine fires, then it's the job of all our instruments to find out what actually happened. Everybody ready? Power on, charging. So what we do in the plasma focus is we don't try and fight these instabilities. We try to use them to compress the plasma and to confine it. 20. 30. Set. Fire. That means the device can be much smaller. The energy can be much more concentrated, and that makes the device much cheaper. Now, that was a free fire. Didn't you hear that? I just want to make sure it's not self-firing. There was a slight ticking noise in there. I couldn't identify it. The scope's still set. Third tray. Power on. Charging. 10. 20. 30. Set. Fire. Now, we know of no reason why this is physically impossible. And more, no one has told us a reason why they think this is physically impossible. And this project is a very public project. We've published in peer-reviewed papers uh, that are among the leading journals in our field. We've gotten a lot of press coverage. People have a lot of opportunity to take pot shots at us. Some people say, this is a long shot. This is way out. Well, ultimately, they're just expressing their feeling. I do say that compared with all the other private fusion efforts, our results at present are the best. So here, here Tom just became our latest shareholder. <laughs> okay, I'll have to stay at that. It's my real pleasure to welcome all of you. I introduce myself. I am uh, the Director General of the ITER organization. It is really my honor and pleasure to uh, address you here today in this role. The ITER project, as you know, is a very promising project, which now gathers seven large parties. All of them, as you know, they are representing over 85% of the gross national product in the world. And all of them are very keen to understand how they will get their energy supply in the long term. All of you know that uh, there is a renewable energies. And uh, we are very keen to see these renewable energies to move on, to progress. But uh, for the time being, it is clear that it will not be able to fulfill the expectation of the world. Oh, sorry. I will, I will say stop. Hello? Oui? 
Qui êtes-vous Et je suis pris là, je ne peux pas vous répondre présentement, vous me rappelez plus tard si c'est possible, dans une demi-heure, voilà, si c'est possible. Merci. Sorry. We are always interconnected. So, as you know, uh, renewable energy is good afford. And for sure... I think we all have great respect for what he's trying to do here, what he has to do. We are all standing behind him to help him to, to get the big puzzle together. It's different, right? I mean, the first two director generals were Japanese and certainly um, different cultures have different approaches to, to work with, uh, different priorities. And Mr. Bigot is a European. So for us Europeans, it's certainly easier, right? To understand what he wants. But if it is possible to demonstrate and it will work for, okay, thousands and thousands of years, I'm ready to wait for 20 years. It's not my problem. No, no, no. You know, the sun is not obsolete even after 5 billion of years. That's all. That's all. Well, that's all. The contribution European is 6,6 milliards to the engagement actuellement. D'accord? 6,6 milliards. And we know that it will have to be added. And the contribution European is 45% of the total cost estimated. Vous êtes tous de bons mathématiciens. Voilà, maintenant vous venez avec le nombre qui convient. Voilà. Vous parlez de 16 milliards, monsieur. Donc. Je ne vais pas me disputer voilà. sur 15, 16, 12, etc. Non, c'est juste pour pas qu'on écrive des ah, bêtises. Voilà. C'est certainement plus de 12 milliards. Well, I think there is something inherently difficult about fusion. That it is uh, an attempt to harness some of the most difficult to harness forces in nature. That you have to get something at tens or hundreds of millions of degrees Kelvin into a tight package, and nature resists that. So that, that is inherently hard. But on top of that, um, there seem to be political pressures uh, trying to blow apart any large project, that once you have to gather many, many people uh, in, uh, from different countries to uh, combine resources, especially over decades and decades, um, the different political wills, the different goals uh, all clash with, with each other. And eventually you wind up with infighting, with cost overruns, and things begin to fall apart after several years. And this is what we saw with Eater Round 1. And the same thing seems to be happening again uh, with Round 2. I'm often asked the question, how do you maintain a sense of urgency on a project that takes 20 years or more? Yeah. And so the answer is that globally, because for this crowd, the Apollo project is what they always think about as the, that, that if we think about how short for most of us 20 years ago really seems and all that has happened, um, the Secretary of Energy was asked specifically to make a recommendation by the 2nd of May this year on that topic, a progress report on ITER and should the U.S. stay in or should they not. Yeah, um, I think that um, it's quite clear that uh, things are moving in a positive direction, but we were digging out of a fairly significant hole, and so um, progress was really necessary. It's up to the American Congress to make the decision. You know, is the project will deliver? Subcommittee on Energy will come to order, and we want to welcome you to today's hearing entitled An Overview of Fusion Energy Science. Is it Eater or Eider? Eater. E Eater, okay. Tokamak. I keep wanting to say Tomahawk, and I know that's, <laughs> that's not right. With the complexity of a multinational collaboration like Eater, this project has faced more challenges than most. Fortunately, today, we have the opportunity to hear from the Director General of the ITER project directly, Dr. Bernard, is it Bigot? Uh, I do believe if we have a proper management, we will be able to deliver on time. We have spent how much money over the last 10 years, the United States? When the U.S. signed up for the project, you know, the representation was made that this project was ready to go to an extent that in retrospect probably wasn't the case. When you think about what we spent on imported oil 
alone. I just wanted to understand the, the dimensions of the cliff that we're playing near when we talk about the U.S. pulling out. Uh, if you're going to have to lay odds on, on okay. all the engineering and all these things coming together, um, what are your odds? I do believe this project could be so beneficial to the world that it is really worth to try and to demonstrate. Okay, let and me, again, let, let we me spoke mention this. There are a lot of wonderful things that we can do in this world. I know. A wonderful things. And Including yep, ITER. Yeah, okay. And ITER may be one of them, but what we do is we judge each one based on the cost and the chances of success. Because in theory, it's such a beautiful and simple idea. Yet throughout, people have found, as soon as they get around the next corner, there is yet another hurdle. Um, and nature seems to have this way of throwing up um, blockade after blockade after blockade that makes scientist optimism uh, look naive. My favorite fusion con man uh, was Richter uh, from Argentina. He was a, a German or Austrian expat, we actually know very little about him, um, who moved to uh, Argentina and managed to convince Juan Perón that he had figured out a method of uh, harnessing the sun. He called it a thermotron. And so they built this secret lab on an island. And this crazy expat was running around, pouring gunpowder in experiments, blowing doors off his lab, writing fusion on ticker tapes everywhere, convincing everyone for a matter of months and years that he had solved the world's energy problems. Until he was finally found out as a fraud and wound up in jail. One of the things that's interesting about his story is that the physicists who first thought about magnetic fusion were inspired by his story. They saw a front page New York Times claim about fusion energy in Argentina, and the scientists here were thinking, how could that be done? My wife and I were planning to leave for Aspen, and my father he said, well, I understand the Argentines have, uh, have gotten ahead of you in this fusion program. I'd seen the New York Times article that uh, a fellow named, named Richter had, uh, had released fusion in a controlled manner in Argentina, and Perón made, made quite a thing of it. I read the New York Times article, and then we got on a train out to Aspen. During the intervals out there uh, on the piston skiing, I was thinking about this. How would one do it if one were if one were, were trying to work out some, some of the general ideas that, that, uh, that I later developed into the, into the Stellarator. So, uh, Spitzer came up with this cool device called a Stellarator. Stellarators are complicated to machine, and they have worse confinement in general, but there's no such thing as a disruption in a Stellarator. And so Stellarators, for the past decade, have just been more and more complicated. They look like squid fighting each other at this point. You can specify what magnetic field configuration you want, so then you give the computer the job of iterating through a bunch of possible different coils until it gets to the right magnetic field configuration, and you end up with something weird, like this. It's cool, right? All right, any other questions before we move on to the tokamak? OK, let's bust a move. Experiment. It's a stellarator, which has a lot of advantages over a tokamak. The biggest advantage is that it can just run. It just, you know, 
for hours, hopefully. And once you can do that, you can build a power plant. Um, and so tokamaks right now have a problem where they just, they can't run continuously. But this experiment is designed to show that it can be done continuously at parameters that are good enough for fusion, so. I came here and I came to know about Stellarators and somewhere along the line, I switched from believing in tokamaks <laughs> to more in Stellarators. And I thought, yeah, maybe this is the future of energy and fusion. Well, this project uh, has not, would not have been possible without uh, the reunion of Germany. It is uh, co-financed by Europe to a big extent, but still the project team is, uh, is in our hands. We had to take care that we have young people being able to do physics now with a new machine and really to make, to make this a, a team. Wendelstein is a, a highly optimized uh, Stellarator device, three-dimensional design. It goes back about 20 years. And um, to build this, to get the support to build this, they had to build it in the then reuniting Germany. It's a crucial part of the story. So they started a completely new institute from nothing up here. And they had to go into building something that had never been built before. Now, unsurprisingly, it ended up being more complex, inexpensive, and difficult than they planned. Ich bin natürlich gerne der Einladung heute gefolgt, um gemeinsam mit Ihnen das erste Wasserstoffplasma-Experiment hier am Wendelstein 7X zu starten. Und da kann man wieder sagen, es ist ein Startschuss für ein weltweit einzigartiges Experiment, das uns der Energiequelle der Zukunft einen entscheidenden Schritt näher bringen kann. Und wir erhoffen uns natürlich aus den Erfahrungen mit Wendelstein 7X wertvolle Erkenntnisse für den internationalen Experimentalreaktor ITER in Südfrankreich. Dort soll dann das Verhalten des brennenden Plasmas näher untersucht werden. Wer sich in bislang unerforschte Gebiete vorwagt, weiß oft nicht, wohin der eingeschlagene Weg führen wird. Und das, was wir immer wieder uns im Auge behalten müssen, ist, Grundlagenforschung ist in dem Sinne zeitlich nicht immer planbar oder gar nicht planbar. Manchmal hat sie auch Nebenerkenntnisse, von denen man es gar nichts geahnt hat. Aber ohne Grundlagenforschung wird man eben auch bestimmte Erkenntnisse nicht äh, gewinnen können. Wenn, wir dann, also, wenn Sie diesen Knopf drücken, dann beginnt da drüben äh, der Countdown zur ersten Plasmaentladung mit Wasserstoff. Das dauert dann 60 Sekunden. Und dann sehen wir, Frau Kanzlerin, drücken Sie rauf. Jawohl, gut, vielen Dank. Der Countdown läuft. Da läuft er. So, jetzt sind wir gleich soweit. Bitte. So, wir haben es kurz gesehen. Landmark in the history of fusion to see with this okay accelerators it works right away very good she's a real great scientist uh, she know how to organize the work of his people to give good priorities and I really believe she deserves full recognition for his achievement Well, this fusion business has been going a little slower than we were all hoping when we started this company. We started with Greg Gotso, we said, ah, yeah, we're going to whisk that up. And then we ran into difficulties, so it's a little longer than, than what we wanted. So it's a little bit more challenging, but we, we're still optimistic that we're doing good progress. It's going a little slower than I'd like, but it's, it's advancing forward, so we're not kind of stuck. So mood is okay, but now we're, 
we're kind of gearing up for a bit more of a long run than a, than a quick success. We're certainly not the startup anymore. Like uh, we, we used to be a, a real scruffy little startup, but uh, now we're getting uh, more people. It's a bigger shop and we've been here for a few years. We have shown some result. This is 1,500 microseconds. The compression time is only 180 microseconds, a little time here. So the magnetic field is up and up and up. This is good, this is what we want when you compress the magnetic field, trees. But then again, you see all those oscillation, both on the outside sensor and the inside sensor, and then the plasma crash, like it, it dies here. What we want it to do is to go up, 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 probably to about this height here. So we're clapping it now, uh, Todd. So stop blowing. Stop blowing. Okay. So it's always a stressful event because if we let air into the chamber, it's filled with moisture and it'll ruin the quality of our vacuum. It'll take weeks and weeks to recover. Oh gosh. All right, Don, cut the flow yeah. in. Now. Yeah, you can cut it now. Okay. Very good, thanks. Did it. Five years ago, when we were starting up and building our first machines, we were having things blow up every day. It was, it, it, people were scared. The siren really made people frightened. There's no point building the wrong thing, though. I got it. So Yeah, absolutely. I know, I know. But the flip side of that is that that can go on for a while, right? Mm -hmm. I know you got a good handle on them, just I gotta ask. But but I'm I'm not against actually restarting our frosty thing. I well, uh, because, <laughs> because in my opinion, we should try all the available targets. Got it. However, because you know you don't know what the hell would work we've or not. Decided that we have a pot of work, and we're trying know, to fill people. We're trying to put people in those pots. No no no, we don't have enough people to fill in those pots. So we wanted to get people to put into those pots. But what we have done is got make a, made a pot. new pot. Mm. Yeah. Be careful yes, that. I, yeah, yeah, I understand the problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I, I like mechanics. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a practical physicist, an experimental physicist, and it's true that at work I don't, I don't do the work anymore. Now I'll, I'll my guy do the work, and we just, I push paper and answer emails. Sometimes I go in the lab and turn some screw just because I like it. But yeah, this is one of the hobby that I have. I put my hat, that's my mother hat. She knitted this one. Oh, long time ago, must be at least 30 years. She passed away now. She won't knit me a new one. My name is Mark Uran. I was uh, previously the director of the International Space Station Division at NASA headquarters, and I spent 28 years working on the space station program, and I now work uh, for the U.S. ITER project. What struck me the strongest from the very first year as I began to meet the people that were engaged around the world was how much this was like the International Space Station program. Uh, ITER, when I joined, was right around the end of the uh, final design phase. And today, they're on the cusp between final design and construction. And the space station program, uh, toward the end of the final design phase, was really quite chaotic. Uh, they had not yet r reached a point where the decision-making process was being done in, in accordance with practices of systems engineering. It took two to three years to accomplish that turnaround. 
uh, because this was a, a project that spanned five partners and involved on the order of five to 10,000 people around the world. So it's, it's like trying to change the course on a super tanker. So when I joined ITER four years ago, the process was similarly chaotic and certainly in need of a, a regimented and disciplined systems engineering approach. And over the past four years, I've seen progress in that direction. This, this is uh, a real test, human civilization. And it's a test that we can't afford to fail. We have to prove that we have the intelligence to prevent our own extinction. see it for the first time is really something which is very exciting for me. I like it better. Huh? To be able to work on fusion, I think, is, is for me, is a dream come true. But it's not just us, it's actually you guys as well, because your support or your taxes are putting force to this, to, to the, the dawn of the fusion age. And so, to, to a large extent, I thank you guys, one, for your curiosity in coming, but also for your support for fusion. So, thank you. Hi. Chuck Flanagan. Hi, Chuck. Hi. Back during the uh, engineering design phase, I was a deputy manager for the U.S. team. Oh, fantastic. I've a long awesome. time, but I've been retired since 95, so the Munich television people came out. They mm -hmm. wanted to know, how can, how can you be working on something that's going to last 50 years in the future? Mm -hmm. And Ken said, have you ever been into a cathedral? Yeah, exactly. Those people never saw the final product. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they passed away, but I mean, also Good job. people like Spitzer. Same yeah, way. Right, so. exactly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And also thank you for laying the foundation of the road yeah. to get to where we are today. I came on February 14, 19, uh, 2008. I left uh, CRPP, Lausanne, Switzerland, one day and showed up here the next day to start working. Well, this is cool. I get to go on site. I've never gone beyond this point. This is like in Frodo, you know? I've never been, this is like a, you know, a first step on the site. This is cool, isn't it? Go this way. 
I look at this and I see what is gonna happen in five, 10 years. So even though I haven't been down there, I know what it is in my brain. I can see the vessel, I can see inside the vessel, I can see everything, but I can't see the plasma side. That one, that one I'm looking forward to seeing. Okay, let's go. I wanna get down there. You guys are holding me back. This is pretty cool when you think also that we're uh, gonna be about 30 meters underground. It's weird to be here. And to think that uh, in about 10 years time, there's gonna be about 100 million degrees Celsius above, sitting above us. And another four and a half meters up is the level one, the ground floor, Koji's launchers. Next level up, level two, the diagnostics, the heating systems, the ion cyclotron, electron cyclotron, it's all there. Just give it some time, it'll come. Oh, oui? Monter là-haut avec, avec l'équipe. Oui? Mm -hmm. On a le droit d'aller là? Vous parlez français? Oui, on parle oui. français. Oui, okay. Je suis curieux. Vous, vous savez exactement qu'est-ce qui ça va venir ici? Quel est le but de ce, ce projet? Je suis curieux. Ce n'est pas un test, ce n'est pas un examen. <laughs> Mais euh, vous, vous savez qu'est-ce qu'on fait? Oui, c'est du nucléaire. Mais nucléaire, mais c'est en fait. Après, exactement les molécules et tout ça, on ne sait pas non, trop. C'est pas trop notre métier. Ouais. Non, non, notre métier, c'est plus non. le coffrage. Ouais. Euh, voilà. Mais après, ce qui va se faire plus tard, on n'est pas trop dans le. Dans le. Ouais, ça, dans les physiques de plasma et tout ça. Après, ouais. ce qui se passe, mais voilà. Ouais. Nous, voilà, ouais. c'est plus l'avancement du chantier. C'est moi, je suis un physicien. Euh, mon système, c'est pour faire le chauffage. Ça chauffe le plasma. Et l'idée, c'est que. Dans le futur, um, on utilise comme un, un litre de l'eau de, de la mer, on enlève juste un petit peu, on met dans sa machine et ça donne l'énergie. Et dans chaque litre d'eau, c'est équivalent de quelque chose comme 350 litres d'essence. Oui, c'est un prototype pour remplacer les autres centrales. Oui, exact. De, de, de nucléaire et aussi des euh, de, de fossil fuels, de, de charbon, de, de pétrole et tout ça. Okay. Moi, comme un gamin, j'avais envie de faire ça. En fait. À l'âge de 14 ans, j'ai décidé que j'avais envie de faire euh, la physique et de faire ça. Du coup, de 14 ans À 14 ans. Je suis un petit peu débile mental. <rire> non, mais j'ai jamais pensé de réaliser ma rêve. Mais en euh, même temps, je trouve que ce que vous faites, c'est la même chose. C'est un rêve dans le sens, parce que vous faites quelque chose... Grâce à vous, c'est aussi... Grâce... Bon, grâce à nous. Oui. C'est nous qui faites. Ouais, ouais, ouais. C'est nous ensemble. On a eu beaucoup de fierté à... à, à parce qu'on est conscient que c'est l'avenir du monde qui se joue ici aussi. Oui. Et... Ouais. Ah oui, oui, tout à fait, c'est l'avenir. Oui. Ouais. Euh, merci. Merci. Voilà. Non, mais merci, merci à... Merci à vous. C'est une, une, une dernière chose. Une dernière ouais. chose. Merci. merci. Mon, mon souhait à moi... Oui. Ce serait que euh, le plus de pays au monde puissent bénéficier de... Oui, voilà. ouais, je suis absolument oui, d'accord. Ce serait mon seul, mon seul plus cher. Ouais. La prochaine fois qu'ils vont le faire, c'est à mon pays, à Cap-Vert. Ah, J'ai envie de visiter vos pays. Ouais. Oui, parce que j'adore la nature, c'est vraiment joli de voir. Ouais, I think that ITER will probably work and it will demonstrate that fusion is doable. I think that as a project it's very difficult because it's international, so there's all sort of project management issue there. So they're gonna blow their budget and their schedule big time. It's just become such a tower of Babel in there. It's, it will burn money at twice the rate that you need to do it. But they'll, they'll plow through it, it'll get built, and it'll work. And this will, in my opinion, give a big shot in the harm of fusion, because here's a machine that showed it can be done. However, 
as a power plant, I don't think it's very practical. It's a machine that's very complex, very expensive, a little unreliable. There's those disruption in there that happen that can damage the machine. It's, it's difficult to conceive that such a machine can become a reliable day-to-day -day power plant. But you know, it's, it's, it's like the, the, the Wright brother, you know, like that plane wouldn't have to take 100 passengers across the Atlantic, but it evolved. When somebody showed that you can fly after that, lots of investment and money goes in. After that, the excitement in fusion will go up because right now, there's not much excitement about fusion. If you look at the alternative energy concept, do you ever hear about fusion? Uh, wind, mill, solar, tide, chicken shit, whatever, but never fusion. Ah, this is the Portman's Bridge. It's brand new, actually. It's one of those cable stray ones. It's actually quite nice. A billion dollar <laughs> to build such a thing. It's about 20 billion for 20 years, a billion a year. Fusion, I mean. One bridge a year to try to develop a new energy source that will replace all the fossil fuel and the pollution and the global warming. Let's do it, you know? Like one bridge a year. Peanuts. Hopefully, we can crack this nut very soon. I will work on this thing all my life until it works. This is, this is my great dream in life, you know? I want to make fusion happen. their minds by chasing after money and dreams that can't come true i'm glad that we are different we've better things to do may others plan their future i'm busy loving you one two three four Sha -la 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 -la, live for today And I have to say that I was starting to be a little nervous on the money situation before uh, the, the Malaysian came in because, you know, the money in the bank was going down and it was getting, oh, we're going to run out. And then they came in and then the, all the investors put more money in it. So now we're having actually the, the longest runway in front of us that we had ever. He's going to make the difference. Yeah. Yeah. You hear that? That's a glowing recommendation. Baby, I need to feel you inside of me. I got to feel you deep inside of me. And baby, please come close to me. At current levels of financing, approximately the age of the universe.